It's nice to celebrate the Eucharist with this small, intimate gathering this afternoon. Some have been wondering how are we f funding the convocation, and those that have the back pews, they paid extra for that prime seating in the back. We know that's the preferred seating in Catholic gatherings. And <laughs> President Menace asked me to note that when you when you kneel and feel the comfort of those cushions, notice Benedictine College was the sponsor and send your sons and daughters to Atchison. <laughs> Praise God. The, the convocation for me so far has exceeded my greatest hopes and prayers. And thank you for your prayers, for my intentions. They've been fulfilled. The Cardinals won last night. <laughs> no. What an uh, amazing time this be has been. And uh, you know, in this, this space without windows, we begin to lose a sense of time. I, I know someone this morning said, this evening, and this afternoon, uh, this morning. Um, but that's how the liturgy is meant to be. Uh, we're, we're to lose ourselves in this eternal time. That said, I'll try not to make the homily and eternity for you. <laughs> you know, St. Francis is, it's providential that we celebrate our convocation in this Mass on this feast of the great St. Francis. And you know, Francis, uh, he, he's in a lot of gardens. He's one of the most popular saints. Um, but our readings today remind us a part of Francis that sometimes we can forget. That first reading was chosen for this feast day because Francis bore the stigmata. He bore the wounds of Jesus. And I want to ask you in your intentions today to pray, to pray that we all might ask the Lord to give us a spiritual stigmata, that he might give us an experience of his wounds, those wounds of love, and to give us the courage to be the wounds of Jesus for the world today, to bring that incredible love that he first brought to the world. You know, we began this day thinking about the family. You know, Francis, uh, we think of all of his admirable qualities. I think he must have been a difficult child to raise. I mean, when we remember that Francis, he was kind of a playboy in his early years. He was kind of the, 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 the town party. And he had this amazing conversion. And he was so moved by that conversion, he does what young people that are converted do. He started giving away his father's goods. <laughs> and he's even hailed before the bishop in a court about this. And so uh, his father presses these charges about Francis giving away his stuff, and what does Francis do? He becomes the original streaker. He takes off all of his clothes, gives them to his father, walks out. Francis had a bit of an attitude, you, you might say. <laughs> remember, uh, some of you are too young to remember streaking. It's a good thing for our culture and society to forget. There is this period where Someone thought it was a good idea to run naked through different events. And actually, at a parish I was in St. Louis, they had a, we had a streaker at one of the masses that, fortunately, I didn't have the pastor had. He was a, a very wise old pastor. And after the streaker had made his way through the church, he just looked up and said, 
Don't worry, people, he wasn't Catholic, he didn't genuflect. <laughs> and we heard from one of our Protestant brothers, and wasn't that beautiful to have those Protestant ministers with us today? The Lord told Francis, rebuild my church. And Francis, like maybe many bishops, we would think, oh, he's talking about fixing the buildings up. And that's what he did. He went about fixing up San Damiano. But he came to understand that the Lord was asking him to do something much more. Yes, I think it's important that we take care of our buildings. They're symbols of what we, of what we prize, and they're, we try to give God our best in making beautiful spaces, not that we can ever make anything worthy of God, but to show that we're trying to give the Lord our very best. But the renewal of the church has to be the renewal of the hearts of his people. And that's that's what our gathering really is about. The Lord is asking us, just as he asked Francis, to rebuild the church. Recently, I was at a gathering, uh, Mike Scherzlick, we're so blessed to have the School of Faith here in the Archdiocese and what incredible work that they do. And Mike, uh, he talked about his son Xavier today and his driving prowess. Uh, Xavier is quite an evangelist, actually. It shouldn't be surprising growing up with Mike and Sandy as his parents. But on Sunday night, Mike will often have a group of 10, 12 young people at their home. Uh, they always have food, so that's one way to get young people there. But they have meaningful conversations and they pray the rosary together. And he invited me to come one evening for that. And that particular evening, they were focused on a, a particular article. And it was an article by a psychiatrist. I'm missing where I have her name written down, but anyway. Francie Hart Brockhammer is her name. And she talked about this, and we heard that from Henry Hodes today, this death by loneliness, this epidemic in our society and culture today. He talked about those demographics and how if we live in different zip codes, we might have different life expectancies. But there's another demographic within there and it's, it's because of this alienation, this loneliness that is part of our culture. She starts this article off by talking about being called in uh, to counsel a man who had, was suicidal. And he's, she says this, she said, Mr. White discussed the recent loss of his parents his struggle with employment and finances, rejection by his siblings, and resulting homelessness. He was particularly distraught when discussing the loss of his, of his dog. He's, he said this, she was the only thing in this world that viewed me as someone worth loving. I sleep in the park, and everyone that walks by thinks I'm worse than a stray dog. I'm subhuman. No one cares about you when you're in my situation, except for her. She cared for me. My whole life's purpose was to care for her in return. Now she's gone, and I have nothing left in the world. Wow, how sad that someone in our society today would think the only one that cared about him was his dog. 
Dr. Brockhammer talks about what she calls death of despair. She says this, economically, as Amer America is more prosperous than it has ever been, we're richer, more connected electronically, and have more information available to us than ever before, and yet we're in the midst of a crisis that is claiming thousands of American lives. Loneliness. She says that since the turn of the century, Americans have been dying from suicide, alcohol-related illnesses, and drug overdoses at a rate that has never before been seen. And she calls these deaths of despair. She writes, suicide is the second leading cause of death for American teenagers and the tenth leading cause of death for Americans overall. Equally harrowing, drug overdose is the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. Just to put that in perspective, in 2017, 47,000 Americans committed suicide, and another 70,000 died from drug overdoses. That same year, 40,000 Americans died in motor vehicle accidents, and 58,000 Americans died in the Vietnam War. So in a single year, we've almost doubled the Americans that died in the Vietnam War between drug overdoses and suicide. Now, suicide and drug addiction are complicated issues. But underneath that, there is, for so many, this longing for connection, this longing for friendship. The Wall Street Journal recently published an op-ed piece by a, a woman by the name of Erica Anderson, and she wrote this. The rate at which Americans take their own lives has been climbing for 20 years, prompting policymakers and medical experts to search for novel suicide prevention practices but one approach is as old as civilization itself, religious faith. Encouraging the most vulnerable Americans to attend religious services could reduce the suicide rate, and a new type of church growing in the U.S. shows particular promise. A 2016 study published in JAMA Psychiatry found that American women who attended religious services at least once a week were five times less likely to commit suicide. The findings based on data from 90,000 women from 1996 to 2010, they followed them, are consistent with the 2019 Pew Research findings that regular participation in religious community is clearly linked to higher levels of happiness. It's true that the correlation doesn't prove causation, but there's strong evidence that people who attend church or synagogue regularly are less inclined to take their own lives. I think, citing the same study, Dr. Brockhammer said in a Harvard study that followed 89,000, nearly 90,000 women over a 15-year period. Listen to this. Catholic women who attended Mass weekly, who came to Mass every Sunday, in other words, their suicide rate was half that of the general population. And of the 7,000 women, this is interesting in this Harvard study, of women who went to Mass at least one more time during the week, their suicide rate was zero. In Dr. Brockhammer's article, she quotes another author who, reflecting on these trends in our culture and society, was, what are the things that are essential for happiness? And this is what this particular author concluded, 
There are four things essential for happiness. A family who loves us and whom we love. Friends with whom we can confide, virtuous friends. Third, meaningful work or activities. Thinking what we do with our life makes a difference. And finally, a worldview that can make sense of suffering and death. Doesn't that describe what our church offers to us? Where else in our culture today do we find marriage and family life encouraged and supported as we do in the church? Where else do we have the opportunity to make friends, virtuous friends that share our values and our beliefs and our desire to follow the Lord? And we can have these significant conversations Meaningful work, you know, I think sometimes people tell me, oh, Archbishop, our priest works so hard. And they do, but really it's not work. It's doing what we believe in. We get to spend our whole lives doing meaningful work, doing things that we believe in. And everybody in the church that's involved with the church, we're doing the most meaningful activity, our efforts, our works, our ministries, have eternal implications for the lives of people. And where else do we find a worldview? And I love our Protestant brothers and sisters that were with us, but frankly, as I've read a lot of conversion stories, that we have the richest spirituality within the Catholic faith to make sense of suffering. And as we spoke last night, we have the antidote to death, the promise of Jesus Christ for eternal life. My dear brothers and sisters, our gathering here is because we have not only the ability, but we have the responsibility to share the gift of friendship with Jesus Christ and, the bri and his bride, the church not to push it down people's throat, not to do the proselytizing that we might find off-putting and others might find off-putting. But as has been, you know, I think so well presented us today, simply to share with others what gives our life meaning and purpose and joy. Our world is desperate. They're dying of loneliness and despair. And we have the immunization, we have the cure for this loneliness. That's what we're called to be as a church. And our suffering, our sharing in the cross of Jesus, our becoming the wounds of Jesus, it's in our suffering that our witness to our faith can be most profound. As many of you know, my father was killed, he was murdered, when my mother was three months pregnant with me. He was murdered on December 18th, 1948. And I remember having a conversation about 10 years ago with a friend of my mother's. Her husband and my father played baseball together. That's how they got to know each other. She wasn't Catholic, she was a Protestant, devout Protestant. But she had kept a friendship with my mother all these years. In fact, when my mother was in her own apartment, they would still have pajama parties. She would come over and spend the night, sometimes with my mom. And I, I said to her one time, I said, Marcella, thanks for being such a good, faithful friend to my mother. And she, she said, well, you know, you're your mother had a great impact on me. She said, when your father died, I was afraid to call your mother. I didn't know what to say to her in, in this circumstance. But she said, I finally 
built up that courage. And she said, your mother was all concerned about me and about my life. She said that this gave her a respect for our Catholic faith. She, she sewed a stole for me when I was ordained a priest, this Protestant friend. But it was an impact that my mother was given this opportunity to witness because of this tragedy in her life and in our family's life. And it's really our sufferings that become these opportunities when we see them through the eyes of faith to make our faith real and so attractive to others. It's our faith that gives us the ability to have hope, not that we're not immune from the pain and from the sorrow and the sadness, but it gives us a capacity to understand suffering and see that it has meaning and power when we unite it with that of Christ, when we bear the wounds of Jesus in the world. Our gospel today is a favorite of mine. I think it's the only time in the scriptures, at least in the English translations, that Jesus uses the word easy. <laughs> he says, my yoke is easy and my burden light. The, this one garment that I wear, the pallium, it is the only unique garment to archbishops, and it's usually given on the feast of St. Peter and Paul by the Pope. I received this in 2005 from Pope Benedict at that time. And it's meant to be in the shape of a yoke. It's a symbolic reference to that passage that the oxen's yoke that connected him to the plow that he pulled. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy, not because what he asks us to do isn't difficult and challenging. No, because Jesus, he's not like an, a contemporary politician. He doesn't tell us, vote for me and everything's going to be great. No, he says, take up your cross if you want to be my disciple and follow me. But he says it's easy because I will carry it with you. I will give you meaning and purpose even in the midst of the cross. This is a great gift that has been given to us. And it's a gift that we have an obligation to share. You know, I sometimes at my confirmation homilies in recent years, I remind the young people that when I was confirmed eons ago in the last millennium, when dinosaurs still were on the earth, <laughs> the bishop would slap each person being confirmed. I tell them that's when it was really fun to be a bishop. <laughs> Today I get to shake your hands. But it, he didn't hit you hard, but it was to be a symbol, to follow Jesus meant that we have to be willing to follow him all the way to Calvary, to embrace the cross in our own life, and to be witnesses, witnesses through all the ups and downs, the joys and the sorrows of life, of the power of Jesus Christ to give us peace, to give us joy, to give us hope, to give us this power to love, even when we're hurt. You know, in Kansas, we're blessed to have a priest that's being considered for canonization, Father Emil Capon. They have a high school in Wichita named after him. Father Capon, if you're not familiar with this story, was as a young priest, he volunteered to be a military chaplain in the Second World War. Once the war was over, he came back. His bishop saw an opportunity because he qualified for the GI Bill of Rights to send him away to get a degree in education, probably to help in high school work. But the Korean War came up, came up in the midst of this, and Father Capon volunteered again. Father Capon was captured, 
when his soldiers that he ministered to were in an intense battle and he had been ordered by his commanding officer to get back to safety, but he refused because he believed his place was with his men. And he spent the rest of the war, the rest of his life, he died in a POW camp. When that camp was liberated, the liberating soldiers said there was something different about this camp. There was a com camaraderie amongst the prisoners. There was a spirit, there was even a hope just, but they had, had all the same problems that all the other camps. And when they asked them, what's at the source of this spirit that you have, this camaraderie? They said, well, our chaplain, Father Capon, even the Protestants, even the non-Christians said this. And they said he taught us that we were free, even in this prisoner of war camp, free to fulfill the purposes that we were created for to love God, to honor God, and to care and look out for each other. And I tell the story that when he finally became, you know, he would sneak food to those that were sick. He would risk himself uh, by reappropriating some of the food of the Koreans for these prisoners. And when he himself finally gets sick and he's ordered to go to the infirmary, which is the death sentence, nobody came out of the infirmary alive. His fellow prisoners are carrying him on a stretcher and they go in front of the commandant's house and the commandant is standing outside there. Father Capon asks him to wait. With great effort, he raises himself from the cot and he says to this commanding officer who had been very harsh to him, the other soldiers, he said, I'm sorry if I've made your responsibilities more difficult. He showed them that you can even love your enemies. You can even love the gospel, or you can even live the gospel with that purity. And so, dear friends, tonight on this free feast of St. Francis, who, yeah, Francis was... He loved nature, he had a great joy about him, but it, his life wasn't easy. The very end of his life, his order had rejected his leadership that kind of cast Francis aside. Francis, I think that was a greater suffering than the physical wounds that he had in the stigmata. And yet his faith helped him to know that there was purpose and there was meaning. My good friends, let us pray that we're willing to accept the spiritual stigmata. Let's give thanks in our time here for those that have been instrumental in giving us the gift of our Catholic faith. For many of us believing parents and others who've witnessed and sacrificed for us so that we know Jesus Christ and his church. And let us ask now that we can become those wounds for others, that we can make his sacrificial love, his unconditional love, alive in the world so that no one in our community thinks the only one that cares about them is their dog. Let us pray that you and I may take up this great mission that's been entrusted to us through our baptism and confirmation to be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to bring its hope, its meaning, its purpose, and its joy to the world. Let us help others to become disciples of Jesus Christ. Let us be disciples and make disciples. Amen.